Okay, perfect. So good morning, everyone. First of all, thank you so much for joining this Headspring webinar on how to create high impact online development. Learn from CLOs. My name is Desiree. I'm a digital marketing specialist here at Headspring, and I am your webinar host today. Um, this webinar is intended to be interactive, so we will have a poll um, and you can also use the chat and send in questions, which we will aim to answer towards the end. Um, with us today is Dr. Nick Van Dam, who is CLO at IA University and Professor and Director of the IA Center of Corporate Learning Innovation. Nick has been a panelist with us at previous Headspring webinars as well. Nick, it's great to have you back. Thanks, uh, Desiree. You're welcome. Um, we're also joined today by Katie Coates, who is a Senior Learning Manager at McKinsey Company. Katie, it's really great to have you here. Thanks so much, Desiree. It's great to be here. And uh, last but not least is our moderator from, for this webinar, which is Henrik Weitz, who will make sure your questions get asked at the end of the webinar. Henrik is the Vice President of Corporate Partnerships at Headspring. Henrik, it's great to have you here as well. Good morning, everyone. Happy to be here. Okay, so Nick and Katie, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I hope um, that you will uh, join us like, uh, like uh, myself here with a cup of coffee uh, and also uh, Katie Coates, uh, who's uh, dialing in from, um, from the East Coast in the US. So it's her early morning, uh, very early morning. So Katie, welcome uh, to this uh, session uh, today um, and for being up so early. Um, so, in terms of uh, just um, you know connecting with uh, with all of you, I'm just wondering. We are wondering where you are. Uh, so you may use the um, annotation tools on uh, on top of your screen or below on your screen, um, or just use the chat room uh, and you know share actually where you are today. And I assume that you know most of you are now by now familiar with uh, with Zoom. Um, you know, as a, a leading platform for, uh, um, for, for, for learning and education. Well, I actually, uh, it seems like, uh, well, you know, um, there are more people, or it's you, Katie, uh, in, in the U.S. again. Uh, um, but, um, yeah. That's let's, me. Let's, That's <laughs> me. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so thank you for, um, for sharing your, uh, your location uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the chat over here. So uh, briefly, um, and Desiree, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, uh, yeah, I've been, uh, as mentioned, I've, I'm the Chief Learning Officer at IE in, in Madrid, IE University. Uh, it's also uh, Headspring is a, um, a joint venture of IE and, and, uh, and the Financial Times uh, focusing on uh, custom uh, leadership executive development programs. Um, I'm the, also the center for uh, for corporate learning uh, innovation. Um, it's a center that we have launched a little bit more than a year ago um, to basically help professionals uh, in, in learning and development and leadership development uh, to, uh, to share a lot of insights into what's happening in our industry, uh, best practices, research, you know, articles, etc. And we also, we are hosting a monthly webinars. So feel free to join us um, um, at, um, at IE, uh, Corporate Center for Learning and Innovation. Um, today, we will talk about, um, you know, digital learning, how to design high impact online learning programs. And we will talk about some of the challenges, some of the, the, the guiding principles. Uh, we have a couple of uh, case studies from uh, Katie, um, Henrik and myself um, to give you some insights actually in terms of uh, designing high quality e-learning. Uh, and then we hope to have about 15 minutes uh, at the end for, uh, for Q&A. And um, as mentioned by Daisy Ray, please uh, uh, put your questions in the, in the chat box. It's only one hour, uh, so that also means from an interaction perspective, um, you know, uh, typically, you know, what we use, what we do is we have a lot of breakout rooms, etc. cetera. Uh, but for this session, not, because we want to make sure that we can share a lot of insights from our end, um, and of course, get you some of your input uh, and, and questions, but we will not use the, the, the breakouts today because of, uh, because of the time of this uh, session. 
On the left side, you see an, um, an article that Katie and I uh, have uh, published uh, um, in June, um, how to turn in-person leadership programs into highly effective virtual programs. And some of the insights uh, of this article we will discuss today in this, uh, in this session, but uh, you can download uh, this article. It's um, you know, uh, about 12 pages. It's almost a, cha a book chapter. Uh, but it will really help you to think about how to design, how to convert digital uh, digital learning. Um, now, in terms of um, you know the the rules of the road, actually, and and this also goes back to uh, pedagogy in terms of uh, list, uh, you know um, um, leading uh, sessions in in Zoom. Uh, we always ask people to uh, put yourself on video. Um, you know, make sure that you are muted, uh, engage. Um, and for, for, you know, uh, as a participant, uh, um, it's key to, of course, to, to be engaged and to listen, etc. So hopefully um, there is no uh, iPhone, smartphone next to you that's popping up all the time with, uh, with, me me with messages, right? Um, so, um, so one of the questions actually um, that we have, if, if you reflect yourself on, on, uh, on digital learning, on virtual classrooms, um, you know, what are, what, what have you learned over the last, you know, potentially, I guess, six, six months, you know, six, seven, eight months in terms of what are the, your biggest challenges when it comes to uh, creating high quality online learning? So uh, I'm going to ask you to, um, to use the chat um, and to type in some questions and some, some reflections. And then I will ask Katie to... Uh, uh, to just um, look at your answers and, and, and um, you know, to share some of the thoughts that you have in terms of your biggest challenges in, in creating high-impact online learning. So please open the chat and, um, you know, and share share your uh, your the, the challenges that you have um yeah a lot about engagement how do we engage our our people keeping people engaged and attentive um it's really great questions on kind of improving engagement how do we cut down on our workload that's interesting um how do we provide regular feedback assessments Managing expectations of the participants. The need to be more unique than the rest of the learning providers. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And that's yep. be a comment from a learning provider, right? So how can you be, you yeah. know, if you look at there are so many uh, providers in, in digital learning and blended learning. So what will make you unique as a as a as a and as a provider for high quality digital learning, blended learning, yeah. Yep. Um, one from my, my dear friend in Hyderabad, Sam, creating the experience and engagement elements to be as effective as the ones in live program. That's good, good. To be close to people, that connection, that's something we're working on too, Milagros, it's good. Um, just trying to see what else, attention from the audience. Lots around engagement, Nick. I'd say that's the biggest yeah, thing. Yeah, really. that's a big, uh, big thing. Yeah. No, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, for um, you know for sharing your thoughts in the in the chat. Um, and you know, if 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 we go back in time, actually, we think about uh, digital learning. Um, you know, this is kind of a year. You know, uh, 2020 that we are celebrating. Uh, you know, let's say 100 years of technology-based learning. You know, go back to the 20s, um, in, in, in 1920, um, the radio started broadcasting and the radio was used actually uh, those days already for, for education uh, purposes. So, so um, kind of 100 years. Now, um, you know, fast forward uh, in terms of uh, technology-based learning, uh, the term e-learning um, was coined in 1997. So basically 23 years ago. Um, and look where we are now. Like I said, 23 years later, um, some of us are still using the term e-learning 
electronic learning, uh, but more and more people are using online learning, digital learning. So also terminology has changed a little bit, and I think um, related to e-learning, um, e-learning was was you know kind of used a lot to 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 launch compliance learning in organizations. And um, as you probably, um, you know, your, your own experience too, right? So a lot of compliance learning was not necessarily very exciting for, uh, for, um, for employees. Um, and also, and this goes back to, 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 to digital learning overall. Um, you know, what we have seen over the last, let's say, 20 years particularly, is, you know, the great, the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to digital learning. Um, you know, a lot of research suggests and also, you know, um, probably your own experience too, uh, that a lot of, you know, uh, digital learning that has been deployed actually in organizations has not necessarily uh, lived up to the promises. Um, and it has to do with the fact that, um, you know, in terms of if we want to design high quality digital learning, there's a lot of art and science actually uh, that comes with that. And, um, you know, I, I believe that L&D, uh, you know, and, and particularly, again, if you look back in time, you go back to, to 1920 and today, 100 years, uh, this profession is, this is still a very young profession and uh, has emerged over the years. Um, you know, today there are, you know, amazing uh, bachelor degrees, master degrees, uh, executive master degrees, and, and people who are studying for a PhD uh, in the learning sciences, right? So, uh, and as a consequence, we have gained a lot of insights in terms of what it takes actually uh, to uh, design high quality uh, learning programs. Um, and you see on this, this visual that I developed just before the summer, um, you know, a number of the disciplines actually uh, that are, you know, are basically the foundations for the learning sciences. And I, I think uh, it's an amazing, you know, discipline. I'm, uh, I've been in this, this profession for, for 25 plus years. Uh, and I can say it has never been a more exciting time as today uh, with all the changes that are happening uh, globally and the huge need for capability building, but also, you know, the, 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 the amazing insights that we have from research in terms of how to design high quality programs. Um, so, um, you know, the first I want to talk about a couple of design principles that Katie and I have uh, defined based on, based on our research uh, and also the practices that, you know, we have um, in place at McKinsey and, and, other, and other organizations. Um, and one is actually um, the whole notion that we need to design uh, for user experience. Um, you know, if we think about a classroom program, um, if we want to turn that into a digital experience, it's not just a matter of converting it, right? Um, and it's a little bit of comparison here with, um, you know, on this picture, the, the horseless car, right? So one of the, uh, the first, you know, prototypes of the first car, and again, again it goes back to, uh, you know, a long time ago, um, was, more, was more or less, it was a, a conversion of a, a horse-drawn vehicle, uh, you know, and you see here with a with an horse and a wooden horse hat. And the reason that they had this wooden horse hat is that they want to make sure that they would not scare other horses actually uh, on the street. Now, this prototype, um, you know, never made it actually. Uh, and if you reflect on it, it did not necessarily um, took in consideration all the insights uh, in automotive design. Um, as well as, you know, functionality of, of, and, and all kinds of new emerging technologies that could be used. Um, now, uh, so one of the guidelines for, um, for, for, for converting actually uh, or designing digital learning is all about user experience. And, and the term user experience uh, was coined by the former Apple VP, uh, Donald Norman, um, and if you think about the, the user design, there are a number of different elements of user design. It's about, it's about easy access. It's about navigation, um, personalization, very important. Uh, the interaction with, with classmates, uh, but also with the faculty, the facilitators, uh, the leaders. It's about, you know, the, the break, you know, giving, giving breaks, breaks, you know, uh, in, in sessions, right? So you don't want to have a, a five-hour you know, virtual classroom session, it, that, that simply doesn't work. 
um, and a, a methodology that um, that has been launched by the design school of Stanford is design thinking and I bet that most of you are familiar with design thinking to become widely successful uh, and used for product and service design. Uh, but it's also exciting that you can use design thinking methodology uh, to design uh, blended learning, digital learning, virtual classrooms. Um, and basically design thinking starts with putting yourself in the shoes uh, of a persona, right? So of a, a potential uh, candidate who will attend a program. Um, so there's already kind of, you know, there are books published on, on design thinking for learning. Um, it's also um, a methodology that uh, um, I'm using in, in, um, in my international masterclass learning and development leadership. Uh, so very powerful. So I encourage you to uh, look it up if you're not using it, buy a book. Uh, and, and it's a very powerful concept. So, so that's kind of one guiding principle. Uh, the other one is uh, relates to you know all the insights we have um, when it comes to um, you know learning and how our brain works um, and over the last you know 10 15 years we know so much more about how we learn as individuals and actually what it means for learning design so as an example uh, a couple of a uh, couple of um, insights for for design uh, one is uh, cognitive the cognitive load theory and 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 this theory says that you know we we should not you know overload attendees you know of programs of our programs with a lot of information because our working memory um, has a very limited capacity uh, and therefore you know if you just cram in more and more information in a course people will just not retain it. It, it not, doesn't work actually. Uh, so it's important to focus on really stepping back. What are the learning outcomes that you expect from a specific program? And then the question is how much information uh, do you need to share? Another key uh, concept is repetition and spacing. You know, we know that information, you know, when it comes to memorization again, uh, is lost, uh, you know, in short time. And therefore, it is very important if we want to make sure that people memorize things that we uh, repeat actually the sharing the information a number of times, but also there is time between the sharing. And therefore, and one of course, you know, one hour, you know, uh, if it's your objective that people retain certain knowledge, it typically it won't be the case. It needs to be spaced out. It needs to be. Uh, repeated a number of times. It's also in interesting that people retain the most of inf most information of, of information that is shared at the beginning of a session and at the end of a session. It's also very interesting. Uh, another key uh, theme is um, active learning. You know, we know, if we think about ourselves, you know, in terms of how we learn, um, we learn, we learn by doing. Um, and therefore, uh, you know, back to your comments, engaging. It's in very important that people are engaged uh, in, 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 in building knowledge, in understanding, in sharing. So that's very, very key. So um, it's also important that uh, the sessions are, you know, are, are not too long, right? So we know that when it comes to attention span, uh, people get easily distracted. And therefore, uh, keeping virtual sessions limited to, let's say, maximum 90 minutes, you know, 60, 90 minutes. That's the maximum uh, when it comes to a virtual classroom. Uh, when you have a self-paced uh, program, it's, it's even too much. And another key thing, theme is that it's important to engage, you know, people every five minutes, every 10 minutes uh, while they are participating. Now, you would say, hey, Nick, you know, so if you share this, okay, this is time for us to interact and share, right? So, and that's what I do typically, right? So I would stop here and then I would say, okay, let's go in a breakout and let's talk about this actually. Uh, or let's launch a poll or let's use the chat. So, um, you know, let's have a conversation about this because that's the way that we will process information. 
Now, again, because it's only, this is not a workshop today, it's only a one hour session, um, you know, I will just share information and there will be limited uh, interaction and I will, I'm violating actually a little bit my own uh, principles that I developed with, uh, with, with Katie. Um, now, level of interaction is, is very important. Uh, uh, key, as I mentioned, building a little bit on what I shared before. Um, but also, um, you know, it's important to use visuals, more visuals than text, right? And um, illustrations are very important when it comes to retaining, retaining knowledge. Uh, and particularly, uh, if we can touch into people's emotions, uh, so if there's a visual that, you know, really has, you know, you feel something with it, 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 may, it, it it's important for you, right? Uh, and, and, and Plato uh, has already, you know, he, he made a comment, you know, a long time ago, he said, all learning has an emotional touch. So um, again, it goes back to how can we make sure that the emotions are part of a learning program and also in, uh, in, um, in a program. So, and last one, actually, a guiding principle here, of an, of, sorry, an, an, an example, is uh, movement. You know, we know that uh, if we move around, um, our, our blood and oxygen levels will increase. And that has a very important impact on cognitive development. So, therefore, it's important that, you know, uh, people uh, move, you know. And what I do in some of the virtual programs, I, you know, ask people to stand up and to walk around. And, you know, uh, they're very important when it comes to, uh, to learning. So, that's kind of, you know, one key guiding principle. And uh, I spoke about emotional touch. So, um, now, if you reflect on this uh, a little bit, you know, uh, and use the chat, so, you know, what do you think what's the most important here when you think about uh, 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 you know the, the lessons is it a repetition and spacing is it active learning emotional touch so um, visualization what, what are the what is key for you here if you reflect on what I just shared um, and you may use the annotation tool you may use the chat actually so what is your what is your number one actually if you if you reflect on this Active learning is a lot of it. All of them are important. A lot of people are saying active learning. It's good. Um, emotional touch. Some stories, using stories. It's yeah, good. stories, very important. Yeah. Someone made a good point. It depends on the objectives of the program. And that's that's right. That's, that's right. Um, uh, there are interdependencies in all. Exactly. They do all play together. Social, being social is key. Yeah. If we have to choose one active learning, <laughs> that's good. It's good, Nick. That's yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. So, um, you know, another guiding principle um, is is enabling pedagogy through learning technology, um, and you know. Um, as you know, like in any technology platform, uh, it has a lot of functionality. So you see on the left side here a number of the learning tools that uh, uh, that are you know part of functionality, are part of different learning platforms. Um, and then you know there are a number of pedagogical techniques here in the middle, right? So one is you want to share knowledge, or you want to create knowledge, or um, the session is about problem solving, how to solve a problem, how to collaborate, and you want to make sure that people collaborate actually on a specific topic. Or it is about, you know, giving personal feedback. Now, um, as you see from this, this, um, this illustration, um, depending on what you want to achieve, uh, there are different technology tools you want to include actually uh, in in the process in your design actually so very important when you keep when you start with your design think about you know learning outcomes think about shifts in behaviors and mindsets that you want to make and then think about okay how can I make sure that I will use the technology in the best way to advance uh, the learning the learning so, um, you know, you're all familiar with, um, with uh, Zoom and you probably also, like myself and Katie and Henrik, you know, we have been using WebEx and Adobe and Microsoft and, 
Centra. There are many, many platforms that, uh, that, uh, that are used. Um, but a lot of the platforms have been designed, not always from a learning perspective. So, um, so at, at IE, we started, uh, you know, I think now three, four years ago, designing basically our own platform. Uh, this is basically really based on the experience from, you know, from people who facilitate and lecture and also from a student perspective. Now, this is an example of the screen of a facilitator. Now, compare this actually with, you know, your experience with Zoom or another platform. Um, and what you see actually is it's, a, you know, it's a one, basically one screen where you have, you know, all the key buttons if you want to share actually a video. Uh, or a PDF, or you want to launch a YouTube, or your slides, uh, or you want to click on breakouts or create a poll. Everything actually is on one screen. So you don't have to, you know, go down in a menu and try to find where some options are. So that's kind of, you know, I think very powerful. But another thing is actually on the left side, you see all the, all the participants of a program. And what you see, and this I think what I think what I really like about this platform a lot is uh, the green, you know, uh, Sheila as an example. Um, every participant we will show is a an, an, an color, um, a green, orange or red. And what the platform does is it will calculate uh, the engagement, you know, you mentioned engagement is key. It will calculate real time engagement all the time and engagement defined by, you know, do people use the chat room? Do they answering polls? Are they asking questions? Um, are they answering questions, right? So, um, so how are, are they really engaged actually? And based on that, I can see, hey, you know, if somebody is a rat, I might say, hey, uh, Sheila, uh, what do you think about this, right? So, and therefore engaging Sheila in the, in the program. So this is just an example of, uh, um, of a platform that, uh, that we are using and how you can, you know, uh, make technology better. Now, what I expect actually, folks, uh, you know, think about Zoom, right? So, um, you know, <laughs> their market capital cap, cap is, is, is higher than the, the market capitalization of, of the top seven airline companies in the world. So they are doing really well. So there will be a lot of you know, focus on advancing their, their uh, technology. Nick, real quick, there's yeah. a couple of questions. Is yeah. this is a custom tool that, that yeah. I have developed? It's a custom tool, yeah. It's a custom tool that we uh, that we are in continue investing in and, and we are it's not a tool that we at this point in time uh, is offered, you know, uh, externally. Uh, that might happen actually. So we are considering if we can develop a SaaS version of it, but at this point it's just a platform that we are using for for our, you know, for our leadership programs and programs for master master students, etc. Okay, so um, another key theme is that um, you know uh, advancing learning through AI, data, and analytics. Uh, so um, you know, if, if you if you if we all know, right? So um, we are collecting a lot of you know we, we are collecting a lot of data using our platforms, and the data can be used to improve you know, the real-time response and engagement, just uh, what I mentioned. Um, it can also help us to advance the design of our programs. Um, and last but not least, it can help to en enhance the effectiveness and the impact. Now, um, you know, uh, there are a lot of ways that data are collected. If you see on the, on the slide here, uh, uh, chat room responses, uh, polls, um, the names of participants, right? So there are a number of, um, you know, a number of moments that, that data are collected and it's key for us as learning designers uh, to look at all the data and see how we can use it. Now, I give you one more example. What I'm very excited about uh, is that um, there's also our proprietary platform. It's called the Wow Room in Madrid. It's a studio. You see here all the faces actually. Uh, and uh, in the studio, uh, we have also now, um, you know, piloted functionality, uh, you know, artificial intelligence, where basically the, the, the faces, the expressions of people 
are read. And, and, and using algorithms, it will calculate an engagement level of people, right? So if people are happy, are, you know, are they kind of confused in the, in, when they look into the camera? So it's also data, again, for the facilitator, for the, uh, for the instructor, that he or she can use uh, to, you know, to focus on engagement in, 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 a, in a program. So very, very interesting. And I think we are also at just at the beginning, actually, of this, right? So using AI uh, for, for lear in learning technology. It's, it, this will be very exciting if we look ahead the next couple of years. Um, the last thing here, uh, well, uh, key, very important is, uh, of course, faculty, right? So if we... Um, you know, if we facilitate online learning, um, it's, it's so important that, you know, we have faculty who are well-trained, understanding the design, the content, but also things like using your voice. You know, um, you know, a lot of voice coaches currently are helping facilitators how they can use their voice in a different way so they can engage people much better, right? So, um, so I think as always, you know, you can have an amazing design, but if the facilitator, if the instructor, if a faculty member uh, is not that well trained, actually, unfortunately, uh, it has a negative impact on um, on the experience. So um, now I will let me go back. I like to sh I like to uh, launch a poll. Um, and I want to ask you to uh, reflect actually on, you know, what are the most, most what's the most important guiding principle for designing the high impact online learning? You know, I spoke about the user design. Is it about the evidence-based uh, pedagogy? Is it about enabling uh, pedagogy through the technology? Is it about the data analytics? Or is it about faculty? So what do you think if you have to pick one? And I know that all of them are very important. Uh, but if you have to pick one, what's on your mind? So, thank you for the results are coming in. Um, yeah, it's not easy to to make uh, to 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 pick one, right? So if you look at the the five different ones, okay, so. I get 51 of you have been voting. Then the last ones are coming in. So, um, yeah, so let me share the results. So, uh, so the user experience, you know, number one, um, tech enabling pedagogy through learning technology. Yeah, number two. Okay, you see kind of, you know, the, the, the reading, but the, the user, putting yourself in the shoes of the user, I can't agree more. It starts with that. And then, you know, all the other things are needed actually to design uh, an amazing experience. Okay, thank you for this. Um, now, um, let me turn it over to, um, uh, to Katie um, to talk briefly about uh, how to convert. Uh, an, 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 if you have an, a classroom program and you want to convert it to a virtual learning solution, what are some of the key steps? Thanks, Nick. And, and you'll see that there's a lot of um, interplay between this kind of method that we put in here and also all of the guiding principles that, that Nick just went through with you. The, the first thing that we do, and, and I don't have enough time to go into a lot of detail, detail now, but I can tell you the article really lays out a lot of great questions and things to consider as you're um, converting. And, and as we talked about, it's not really a, a drop and plop, as I would say. You can't just take a classroom program and just say, we're going to deliver it virtually and here you go. Uh, you really do need to think about it to, to make it effective. The, I can't um, overestimate the importance of doing the kind of the assessment up front. So really taking a look at the current program um, and, and really take the opportunity to, to find out what's that core and critical content that needs to be delivered. Like use this as a time to say, are there other ways to, to teach this content, right? So look at your objectives, look at the feedback from the in-person program, look at kind of the experience you want to create, what are, and what are the really high priority critical um, skills that you wanna develop or knowledge skills, mindset you wanna develop, and kind of think about that um, holistically from a, a virtual perspective. And you can use other things like performance support, um, and self-paced learning to, to cover some of the stuff that might not be as critical. 
The second piece is really that architecture. Um, so it's that macro view of, of what you want to deliver. And I'm going to show you an example that'll make this more clear in a moment. But it's kind of how are you going to lay out the whole program and what's the timing um, using kind of the, the spacing and the interactivity and time for reflection, um, all of those, those critical elements that make a, a virtual program effective. So what's that architecture? And then what, what are the requirements? And, and identify those requirements as early as possible from a technology perspective, from a resource perspective, a faculty perspective. Um, think through all of those like critical elements to deliver it. And then designing the program is really after you've got the architecture laid out, going into each piece and doing the design of each piece of, of the new program. Um, producing the materials, what materials do you need? What, you, what do you have to set up for, to make the program run? So what are the, the handouts, the faculty guides, all of those things. And then the logistics for running the program, and you can't underestimate that. Um, you know, some people might think that it's easy going from classroom to virtual, but there's a lot of things you have to consider. So set up the logistics for the program, who's doing what um, in the actual delivery, and then finally deliver the program and measure the impact. So this model should look pretty familiar. It's very close to, to our instructional design model with just a number of things that you have to consider um, as, you're, as you're doing it. Let's go to the next slide. Let's talk through a case that might that might help. So this is one of our programs at McKinsey. So in my role, um, I am responsible for the strategy and curriculum for 14,000 of our services. So these are our non-client facing uh, professionals across 30 different departments. So we do quite a bit of uh, virtual learning because our, our people are distributed all over the globe. Um, half of them kind of work in, in kind of our, our client facing offices and from home and the other half are in our large um, center operations. So it's, it's we, we've been playing a lot with virtual and we've learned quite a bit. This year just really pushed us into it with COVID and um, we've used it as a, an experimental year. So with our team leader program, um, we did the normal. We had an agenda, right? And we had blocks of time. It was like, okay, we're gonna teach this piece of content, this piece of content, and you can see this. And what we found um, when we did our first piece that needs assessment is that, um, you know, the feedback was that the participants enjoyed the program. They, you know, they liked being together, but there were challenges with transfer. Were they really able to take the learning from that three-day um, experience? and apply it back on the job. And the other um, interesting thing is we really needed to scale it. You know, we could only do like 30 people at a time um, with the design and the way that, that our, our logistics and everything work. Um, and there was a need to do more um, and better. So we stepped back and then, and then obviously the pandemic hit as well. Um, we were in the midst of looking at making this virtual anyway but the pandemic hit. And so we did our analysis and then um, I talked about the um, go to the next slide, Nick, that architecture, that second step is like figure out the architecture for a virtual program. And so this is what we we landed on. We worked really hard um, to figure out. So we had this framework in our classroom program of leading self, leading people and leading work. And that that worked really well. It was a great organizing structure. And then we said, okay, so we're gonna build a four month program where we're gonna focus a month on each one of those, those frameworks. And we're gonna have a mix of, of experiences for people um, in each one of those. And then we're gonna have a, a putting it all together, um, a culminating piece at the end that ties the whole program together. And then, um, you know, as I said, we, we had self-paced digital learning and assignments that are mixed in here. We had coaching cohort teams that worked together on some assignments. And then we had each month, we had a live virtual session that where we really focused on the key skills. It was very interactive breakouts, um, you know, things for people to, to get engaged. Um, and then, you know, along the way, they had on the job assignments and application that were pushed to them um, to, to work on throughout the four month experience. And then in, in the, at the end, pulling it all together, they had to create um, their own personal TED talk where they talked about kind of their leadership style, their leadership um, 
you know, what they wanted to be, um, what their, you know, their goals and their aims, their aspirations for leadership kind of tying together all the principles from the course. It was a really nice culminating activity. And they, they did that in their, their peer groups. So that's the, the big picture architecture. A couple of things just to highlight, you know, the participant orientation critical. We've learned that's a critical. So setting the expectations up front, what's expected from you the conversation you need to have with your manager about this program and how you work together with your manager um, on feedback and other elements um, and, and really getting them level set. We provide information on why virtual learning is effective and your role as a virtual learner. And then we also do the same with our facilitators and coaches an orientation for, for that. And again, cannot um, overestimate the importance of having really high quality facilitators and building that muscle within your organization, developing your facilitators. Um, we've had faculty that were just amazing in the classroom and, and not so great virtually because there's a lot of things you have to juggle. So you, you really need to have high quality facilitators and build um, high quality facilitators. That's one of our big points right now. And Nick, if you wanna to go to the next slide, so once you have that big architecture, the architecture laid out, the, the four month process with things, then you know, your designers have to, to build each chunk out. And this is just a template that we use to, to you know, outline all of the different pieces that we wanna do within the program. Um, you can see it, you know, we come for each section, the outcomes, what's the content, the different types of interactions that you wanna use. And that's important, as Nick said, active learning the media you need to create, and um, the technology that you need to use for each piece of that. All right, Nick, I'll turn it back to you for your Thank next you. Question. Thanks, uh, thanks, Katie. Uh, I think, you know, folks if, and friends, you know, if we reflect on this and uh, a very interesting uh, uh, design of this, uh, of this program uh, at McKinsey, and I know it has been very successful uh, when it goes to, uh, you know, there's one metric that McKinsey we use, it's time for, uh, value for time spent, right? So is it like, well, was it, uh, you know, was it worth actually this experience? And, and the ratings are very high, actually. They are mirroring uh, definitely uh, the classroom, the classroom program experience. So briefly, um, you know, one, one more example uh, uh, in terms of a, a blended learning journey I'd like to show you. And I wanna uh, kick it off with a short video. So, um, you know, this is a, as a number of you know me well, it, one of my passions is to uh, elevate the, the, you know, the profession and, um, you know, I'm delighted that we uh, will uh, um, start uh, in three weeks from now with a group of uh, 24, um, you know, learning and leadership professionals from around the world, uh, over 11 countries, uh, with a 10-month uh, learning journey. Um, and this is also just an example of, of a program where we are using all the design principles um, that I have just discussed and with Katie. Um, and, um, you know, we don't have a lot of time today, but I give you a couple of, you know, kind of key components, right? So there are uh, different blocks, actually, is one block on strategic L&D development, uh, and then the second block, leading L&D innovation. But on the left side, you see uh, a number of the journey elements that are included in the program. Um, you know, uh, of course, a number of uh, uh, live virtual classrooms. Then uh, people um, will get access to a learning platform that will guide them through an entire learning journey. Uh, and basically where they have to work on assignments in small teams or individually 
complete assessments, etc., that will be discussed actually uh, in the live sessions, then there will be two very immersive, you know, um, uh, components. One is a block of three and a half days in the Netherlands, and another block in 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 Spain. And the, when people come together, it's not about PowerPoint anymore. We don't use PowerPoint. This is a very immersive experience uh, that people go through and building on uh, what they have learned. Uh, other elements, you know, as I mentioned, social learning is very important. So people will uh, work in small teams. Uh, they work on different assignments actually during the program. Uh, as Katie also showed, application is very, very key. Uh, then there also will be uh, coaching sessions on, on personal leadership in terms of how to change our own behaviors and, and, and mindsets. And also people work on an, a personal project for their organization. So uh, you see kind of, you know, the high level architecture of this program. Um, again, very exciting. Um, there are two slots left for people uh, last minute uh, consider to uh, boost their own uh, l and L&D experience. Uh, but another case example of a learning journey. Um, then I go turn it back to Katie, who will talk about another brief example from McKinsey on problem solving, also a very important topic uh, um, uh, in, in developing people. Katie. Yeah, so this one just really focused more on a capability development. So the, the team leader was more of a, a leadership transition. You get promoted to team leader and you need to, to you know, ramp up your skills. And this one, um, if you can imagine, problem solving is at the heart and the core of a McKinsey consultant and, and any McKinsey professional. You really need to have these skills to have conversations, to work through um, all the things that happen within the McKinsey context. So uh, we had a three-day in-person program and again it was about scalability it was like how do we how do we get this out to more people so we redesigned that into a six-week program um, we just piloted this and as Nick said one of our, our scores is value for time spent in our pilot we got a 6.7 out of seven um, across the board for for this this particular program and and how it works it's six weeks um, you can see the schedule of activities here there's some pre-work uh, faculty-led session that's using zoom individual application they are pushed um, exercises and challenges via slack because slack is a, a, a tool that we use internally all the time so so people um, know how to, to go in there and access that and then there's also these half an hour peer coaching sessions so we do you know how do you define and structure a problem how do you uh, structure communications around the problem and then um, all the real world you, it's like a project you have your real world problem that you have to work through all the tools with and then share that at the end and again um, all of these mixes of different ways of doing it um, really powerful and the number one thing they loved was the peer coaching opportunities so again i think it ties together some of that connection stuff we talked about and engagement stuff thanks uh, thanks katie and then we uh, have the last um, uh, case study. I will turn it over to uh, Hen Henrik on uh, that one. Thank you very much, Nick. And thank you so much for this uh, immersive and very en enriching experience. I'm uh, grateful to all the participants that are still hanging in there. I still 71 out of 76. So congratulations for a job well done. I know you have been doing this for quite some time now. So really good job. I, conscious of time and I want to allow participants also for a Q&A so I'll try and do it very briefly. I'm, I'm basically serving all our Headspring clients in the Nordics and obviously the past six months everything has been about switching from face to face to digital. Uh, one of the more experimental clients that we have been working with have been quite curious about trying to uh, create what we would call like a Netflix leadership series or even virtual conferences or uh, TV podcasts or broadcasts, which is quite, uh, quite a challenging, but also very interesting from a learning perspective. So you can say in some ways the last past six months had been obviously for everyone a big challenge, but living in the Nordics uh, in a relatively safe environment uh, as I normally say to our clients, and no one will die from this experience. I can guarantee you that it's going to be an experiment. We might lose the connection or we might drop out or we might not achieve the objectives, but 
all of us and even the ones that are able to join this call are in a very privileged position to even be having these conversations in, in this time. So I'm, I'm so grateful uh, that we have uh, clients and companies that are willing to, uh, to work with us. And I think for all of you, it has been a huge experiment and, and, and trying to achieve uh, learning experience. So I would only say a few advices that we have from uh, our clients and the challenges that uh, they have had is really think about what problem you're trying to solve. Don't be too ambitious in what you're trying to achieve. Uh, really try to fix only one or two things at a time because it is very, very demanding to put things virtually. Obviously follow Katie's and Nick's six, six steps model, which I do every day, clearly. And uh, really try and multiply with two anything that you think in terms of resources. If you haven't tried it before, you need to at least multiply it with two if you want to bring it from face to face to virtual. It's not about the tool, it's more about what problem are you trying to solve and what experience are you trying to give your participants. So short advice from our clients and uh, I'll hand it back to Nick and Katie and actually you guys to give us some questions. Thanks, uh, thanks Henrik. Yeah, so um, um, I will skip this because of time actually, um, but basically I want to and make sure that we have some time to answer some questions uh, uh, and answers. Uh, and, um, you know, it was a uh, comment in the chat about uh, uh, down, you know, the article. Uh, you can download the article from, uh, from our website. So uh, just visit the website and you can just uh, download the whole, the whole article. Um, and before I forget, please, you know, uh, feel free to uh, connect with uh, Katie and I on, uh, on LinkedIn or uh, um, uh, on basically... Uh, um, uh, an email. Um, uh, Henrik, would you like to uh, facilitate the, the Q&A questions um, uh, for the session today? Sure. Anyone that has a question, just uh, drop it in the chat. Uh, I, can maybe, uh, I can maybe kick it off by one of the biggest challenges, how to transform educators from face-to-face -to, -face to uh, a virtual learning experience. Do you have any good advices from our participants? So how to, how to again, uh, uh, how to? Yeah, basically, how do we get educators trained for virtual delivery rather than face-to-face? Yeah. -face? yeah, so 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 my take on that is, you know, kind of depends on, of course, the, the, the competencies that an educator has, right? So if you are an educator and you are, let's say, a trainer and you are used to um, deliver just, you know, live sessions, uh, then basically, you know, um, there are a number of competencies that you need to develop, right? So one is you need to understand the technology. Uh, secondly, you need to think about design. So become familiar with how to design now a virtual or digital program. Um, then it's about, you know, the, the how to deliver it, right? So there are a number of things that I mentioned in terms of faculty excellence uh, where you need to think about uh, yourself. So uh, developing a number of competencies, um, you know, that will, that will be a personal, uh, professional investment. Uh, but we have seen actually that um, also the last six, seven months, uh, a number of you know, trainers, educators have, you know, been very, very successful in making the transition from a live virtual classroom uh, trainer to a virtual learner, uh, virtual trainer. Yeah, and I would, just, I would just add one example. We have a, um, a five hour program where people actually learn how to, we, again, we use Zoom. So we, we teach them in Zoom how to facilitate and use all of the techniques and the tools. And they actually have a couple of practice sessions. After they get through that, then we also have them pair and shadow a session or, or co-delivery if they're ready to, so that they're working with another experienced facilitator and then they go out on their own. So that's kind of the process we use. Great feedback. And what our clients really love as well normally is that the more you can involve and the more relevant you can make the context, context and the content and involving even stakeholders internally in the actual delivery could be executives or could even be uh, what some of our clients call everyday hero stories in the delivery that brings the, uh, 
you can say the experience much richer. I'm conscious of time. I'm just trying to see if there's anyone else in the chat. I think we have covered the educator piece. And of course, as someone is saying here, real time life programs are premium end of the market, but mass market is the, is the preserved as extracurricular programs. So I think the message here is basically, of course, live programs are obviously the preferred choice, you know, over recorded video. Uh, we see that as well in all the programs. It's very difficult to get people to join a recorded uh, session after the event. I actually saw a very interesting question. Um, that is, what, what is your view on digital slash blended learning after COVID-19? Has any type of idea emerged yet? Yeah. What it will look like? Yeah, so, so thanks, Desiree. Um, um, let me start, and Katie, uh, maybe from a McKinsey perspective uh, to weigh in as well. Um, so, you know, what I believe is that if we reflect on, um, you know, the, the, what has happened over the last six, seven months, um, you know, the, the digitization uh, of, of, of everything has accelerated, right? So if you think about remote work, um, you know, advancing business models, uh, but also learning. So, so a lot of people, I expect that a lot of people will say, wow, um, you know, already, like I have not, I have never experienced like virtual learning before. Uh, and you know, again, if very well designed, extremely powerful, uh, and therefore, um, you know, a number of, you know, uh, organizations will continue uh, on, on this track, you know, digital, virtual, and there's also, an, uh, of course, an, uh, an sustainability, sustainability factor that plays a role, right? So how much do we want to travel, etc. cetera? Um, so I think that this is here to stay. It, we will have, you know, continued digital virtual programs. Um, and um, I still believe that there's an ongoing need for bringing people together um, for specific reasons, right? So it's all about, it's about the, 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 the high touch experience that people have, the networking, the culture building, the, the problem solving together. Um, so there's still a, a place for that. And, and last but not least, reflection. Um, I think that in our digital worlds where people are kind of, you know, 24 seven on digital, um, there's all such a need for reflection. And that's also something that, you know, giving people time to be away for a couple of days in a leadership program, learning program, it, it provides time for reflection. So, so that's kind of, you know, we are moving to what I always call a high tech, high touch learning strategy, right? So doing both. Um, Katie, your, your end, from your perspective on uh, the McKinsey lens, uh, what's your take on this? Yeah, I get I think this year has been a, a year of experimentation for us and we've we've moved a lot in my space and the, the non client facing space. Um, we have had great success with virtual and we know that we will continue to do it. There's no way we will be able to offer a ton of classroom programs going forward and our people um, are, are getting a lot out of the virtual and we intentionally focused on quality and and high quality faculty to really prove that uh, virtual learning can work. So from that perspective, um, in other parts of, of McKinsey, again, we will shift some to virtual. We will see more and more virtual coming into play, but the consultants, you know, they need, they really need more um, in, in person in touch. There will be a nice blend going forward, but um, in person will not go away. I mean, we will continue to, to have more, more blended learning um, going forward. Okay, well, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we are running out of time now. So we always get so many questions and it's great to see the engagement. You know, it's still on in September. Everyone is back from holiday. It's really nice to see. Um, a huge thank you to Nick and Katie for doing this session. And I also want to say thank you for everyone who joined us today. 
I hope you gained a better understanding of how to design and deliver virtual programs and some tricks and tips around that. If you want any, if you have any more questions or do you, if you want more information about Headspring or what we do, um, you can get in touch with Henrik. You can see his email address on the screen. So please don't hesitate to send him an email. Um, we will also have more webinars coming up, of course. And the first one is actually this Thursday. So you're in luck. Um, to sign up for this one on Thursday, it's on trans awareness in the workplace. And you can sign up and go into headspringexecutive.com slash webinars. Please also sign up to our newsletter to read more about what Headspring is up to and things we find interesting in general and upcoming podcasts and webinars. And that's really all from us. Thanks again, uh, Nick and Katie, and thanks Henrik for moderating. And have a thank you all. all. Right. Bye. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.